Welcome everyone to this uh, session about uh, metal Kubernetes. Uh, my name is Nicolas Tranger. I work as a, an architect at uh, Scality for a couple of years now. Um, and today we will present a solution we built partially in-house um, for some of the needs we had, and I'll go into that in a bit. First of all, about Scality, the company, so some of you may know it, it's basically a storage company, so all we do is storage, both object as well as file, um, for several purposes, uh, mostly in the enterprise and um, service um, provider markets. We have one purpose, which is giving freedom and control to people who create value out of data, so mostly people who have a lot of data. Um, we have a global presence. Um, we have eight offices around the world. We have lots of uh, customers, again, mainly enterprises, which will come back later as well, um, globally, and roughly 200 employees. Our journey towards Kubernetes, I'll sketch a bit the history of the company and the various products we have and how we ended up with Kubernetes um, today, or about a year ago, actually. Um, everything started with our product called Scality Ring, which is an on-premise, large-scale, multi-petabyte storage solution um, for both objects as well as file, where the file part is basically built on top of the object storage. Um, it's made for physical machines. It's storage, so you have directly attached disks. Um, some of the components can run in VMs. It really depends on the, the deployment architecture of what we do. Um, and we only require an operating system to be available on those servers, including some legacy operating systems like CentOS 6 nowadays. Um, the resource pools, as in the number of servers you have, is fairly static. You don't just change this. You don't go into your data center to remove it, um, a machine and add a machine every single day. So this is very static. Um, the role of the various servers is also pretty static. Once everything is configured, it basically works, and you leave it the way it is. Um, this is being built using RPM packages and distributed as such, installed as such, um, and deployed using a solution we have built on SaltStack, which is something like Ansible. I don't know whether anyone in the audience is, uh, is familiar with it. Um, and it is de facto taking over ownership of the host. So when you install this, you cannot just install a second instance of it on the same system unless you would be using virtual machines, but that comes with a performance impact, etc. And post-installation, everything is fairly static. You don't change the configuration, the role of machines, whatever else. Also, you don't just scale up the number of instances of certain of the services we have. Second came a so-called Scality S3 connector, which is a way to access this object storage using the standard, de facto standard S3 protocol by um, Amazon. This also runs on physical servers or on VMs because it's not doing storage itself. It's simpler to run this on VMs. But again, the resource pools are fairly static because even those VMs, they run on physical machines. Uh, it's a sort of a microservices architecture, um, and we decided to build this and distribute it as Docker containers, uh, where those Docker containers are then put on systems, on servers, using some Ansible playbooks. Um, again, there is no runtime orchestration, so if a load goes up, no, we will not spawn up more instances of the various services, etc. Um, and things like log management, monitoring, monitoring of the services, it all comes with the solution. So if you deploy this, then it will also install something like Elasticsearch or whatever else to do the log ingestion, which basically puts the load of um, providing these services on the people implementing the storage solution, which is kind of a different skill set than deploying Elasticsearch or whatever else. Then finally, we started building something called Zenko, which is um, a multi-cloud data controller. It allows you to move data from one cloud, be it on-prem, in Ring, or in Azure to AWS, or to AWS and GCP, or whatever else, and apply certain rules and workflows to those, um, those objects. It can be, or it, the intent is for it, well, not the intent, it can be deployed in the cloud or um, on-prem, which for us is a major paradigm shift, because before all we did was in the data center of a customer, now, all of a sudden, we have something which must also be able to run in AWS, in GCP, in Azure, um, which brings a lot of new challenges, um, but also lots of opportunities, of course. Um, 
So the way we build this was, again, using containers. Uh, some of these are shared with the S3 connector solution, because um, in the end, there are various similarities. In Zenko, all the object access happens through the S3 protocol. Um, for cloud deployments or cloud-style deployments, we started by deploying on top of Docker Swarm, um, but we ran into quite some issues with stability, with performance, etc. So we decided that was not a way to go, the, way, the right way to go forward and put this on our customers' premises. Uh, so about a year ago, I believe it was December 2017, uh, we decided to move to, uh, to Kubernetes, um, both using the managed Kubernetes offerings, which already existed back then on uh, Google and on Azure, then later on Amazon EKS, even though it was announced back then, became actually available. Um, and on-prem for our customers who want to deploy the solution on, in their data centers. Um, the benefits we wanted and did reap from uh, Kubernetes were um, primarily the hom homogeneous um, deployment between in the cloud or on-prem, because Kubernetes becomes kind of the platform, the operating system, so you want, of everything. Um, it can bring a lot of services to your final solution, um, like networking and network policies can be applied. Um, there's service start, uh, service monitoring, um, rolling upgrades, which is built in, which otherwise you have to build yourself in your Ansible playbook or whatever, or whatever else, which is possible, but here the cluster just does it for you. Um, we am, the cluster can take care of logs, of uh, metering and monitoring of your services, load balancing, TLS termination, we all know what it brings. Um, and there's more flexible resource management. So if there are spikes in load, for example, you can spawn up a, more, a couple of more instances of your various pods using the HPA. Um, or you can just add some more VMs to, to your cluster and uh, have more resources available. Um, how we deploy our solution, being Zenko on Kubernetes, um, we decided early on to start using Helm charts. Um, partially because it's allowed us to reuse much of the functionality that exists in various charts, upstream charts, which we use, because as part of Zenko, for example, we use MongoDB, we use Kafka. Um, we have contributed many fixes to the various upstream charts we do use. Uh, we even became the maintainer of, I believe, Redis HA and maybe some other ones. Uh, we also contributed some actual new charts, uh, one of them being Cloud Server, which is our own solution for uh, S3 storage. So if you want to try your application against S3 without actually paying Amazon, you can just Helm install Cloud Server and all of a sudden you have a fully functional S3 implementation running in your cluster. Um, and another one called Cosbench, which is a tool initially built, I believe, by Intel, which is used to benchmark various object storage offerings, including ours. So we use this in our CI to figure out whether there are regressions in performance, um, or benchmark ourselves against other offerings and then pat ourselves on the back. Um, we are currently looking to um, adopt the operator pattern. Um, currently, there is no real need, as in Helm can sustain everything we need. But once we want to be more flexible when it comes to deploying um, and taking care of the existing cluster, like the number of nodes that exist in the cluster, and then figuring out how many replicas of MongoDB we want, um, or we at, if at some point in time upgrades become more orchestrated, then having an operator um, definitely makes sense. This whole solution today, you can try for yourself. Uh, it is fully open source, uh, not just the chart, also obviously the images and um, the source code that runs inside those images. Um, it's available on GitHub under the scalability organization called Zenko. If you don't want to take the effort to you know, clone this and then set up a cluster and install it, etc., we have a hosted offering for testing purposes called Orbit. And if you go to that URL, um, you can simply create an account using a Gmail address or whatever and then play around with everything that, all the functionality that's available. Our journey to Kubernetes for Metal Kubernetes. Um, we cannot expect um, a Kubernetes cluster to be available on our customers' premises. Um, they may not have one. They may have never heard of Kubernetes whatsoever. 
Um, so we started looking into the various offerings that existed back then. There are a couple of new ones um, more recently, but things are the way they are. Um, but most of those, basically all of the open ones which we could find back then, did not really satisfy our needs, uh, which again, given enterprise customers, Fortune 100, um, Customers are rather specific. I'll go into some of the details uh, later. So back then, we decided to roll our own and, and put a couple of people on this project. Um, we dubbed this Metal Kubernetes, um, and the tagline is an opinionated Kubernetes distribution with a focus on long-term on-prem deployments. And I'll now focus on some of these aspects. We call it opinionated because um, unlike some of the existing Offerings, um, we make choices for the user or our customer. Um, and we, we aim to go for a very for an out-of-the-box experience which just works rather than telling you, hey, do you want to use Calico or Cilium or this or that? And do you want to deploy Elasticsearch or not deploy Elasticsearch and that kind of stuff. So we make those choices to have a more of a, an integrated experience. It is a long-term solution, uh, what I mean by that is um, we can't just deploy a cluster, deploy an application on it, and then if we want to upgrade the cluster, actually deploy a second one, and then using ELB or whatever, move over the workloads from one instance to the other. We only have, for example, three servers, three physical machines, five physical machines, whatever, at the customer side. That is all we can use, so it must be possible to upgrade the solution over a very long term, like years, we cannot have the storage go down for any planned maintenance. And it is on-prem, so um, it's based on, on, on physical machines um, with only a base operating system available and lots of the functionality you get in a cloud environment not available. Um, so the scope of this project is roughly three to 20, say, machines. It may work, it likely works with more machines as well because in the end this is just stock Kubernetes, but it's not something we aim for, it's not something we test because it's out of the scope for, for the product as far as we are concerned. Um, it is built on top of the KubeSpray Ansible playbook um, and we use KubeSpray to lay out a basic cluster. So we use KubeSpray to install SCD, to install the control plane, to install uh, CNI, which in this case is uh, Calico, and that's basically where it, <coughs> excuse me, where the, the role of KubeSpray ends. Um, we do add various features like some static and dynamic inventory checks, um, pre-checks. As an example, we found out that if you try to install Calico on a server, um, a cluster, but you use capitals in the host names, then things go really wrong. So we added some pre-checks which validate that you are not using capitals in your um, host names. We do some operating system tuning for uh, performance, etc. We do operating system security stuff. Uh, we actually integrated an OpenStack pro uh, project for this. Um, and then we augment all of this with various services uh, which we think should come with a cluster solution when it comes to operations, uh, an ingress controller, of course, um, and other services. And then one of the important things is we take care of um, local storage, on-prem storage, and I'll go, go into that later as well. So the cluster services we deploy, um, there's really no magic there. Um, it's based on existing open source offerings. Uh, some of those are like, really great. Uh, we deploy Heapster for the dashboard graphs and uh, kubectl top and whatever else. Um, we are aware that Heapster is being phased out, so that will change. Uh, metric server for horizontal pod data scaling. Uh, we are looking in Prometheus integration there. Ingress TLS termination using the standard Nginx ingress controller. Um, cluster monitoring through Prometheus, the Prometheus operator, and everything that comes with it, being Kube Prometheus and all the dashboards, the graphs, and the alerts. Um, Host and container logs through Elasticsearch, including um, Curator to clean up old indices. Otherwise, it just keeps growing. Um, FluentD, FluentBit, uh, and Kibana as a user interface. And all of this, again, to give a great out-of-the-box experience for operators after deploying a cluster. There's a couple of 
screenshots of things everyone has seen before. Uh, this is for the Elasticsearch logs. And this is only one example of the graphs we get in um, Grafana through Prometheus. There's a whole load of those. There are the ones from um, Kubernetes, so very Kubernetes specific. But then we also deploy others to monitor Prometheus itself, monitor etcd, monitor your Elasticsearch, et cetera. <coughs> Excuse me, I had a cold a couple of days ago. Um, storage. Unlike um, Kubernetes clusters which are being deployed on um, the cloud environments, we cannot have something like ELB or persistent disks or, store or block storage from um, Azure available. And also we cannot um, rely on network attached storage to be available because it may simply not be there at the customer site. Um, next to that, many of the services we deploy as part of Zenko, so this is somewhat Zenko specific, are tuned for directly attached storage. MongoDB works with a local disk or can be an attached disk as well. But, um, and those, um, so those services do in-application replication or failover and recovery, et cetera. So there's really no need for us to use um, network attached storage. Uh, we went for what is basically the lowest common denominator between all kinds of deployments, which is local disks, where in a cloud, okay, those are potentially not local, but we treat them as if they are local. Um, thanks to um, persistent, local, persistent local volumes and volume scheduling, uh, we can create PVs, which are then bound by a PVC, and in the end, um, bind a pod to a specific node, which is the case. Uh, we do not use a local volume provisioner, but have a more static approach, whereas part of the playbook you can specify in your inventory which volumes you want to be available, which file system should be on them, how big they should be, of course, which file system options, which mount options as well as um, MKFS options should be used. Uh, we create all these volumes in the various um, LVM physical volumes and volume groups you defined, um, and then we create the PV objects in the Kubernetes cluster. <coughs> We are looking forward to CSI-based dynamic volume provisioning using LVM, but currently that's not done yet. Um, and then at a later point in time, who knows, we may get volume encryption, et cetera. The deployment, um, this is really based on, on years of experience we have with deploying Ring um, at customer sites in various architectures, various environments. <laughs> Uh, the constraints we have in customer data centers are somewhat different than, you know, running a couple of VMs on EC2. Uh, we have customers who have dark sites, like literally no byte can go in or out over any network, so you have to go in with a USB stick. Um, there are customers who have specific rules, in-house security rules related to whether or not you can bind services to 0000. zero, zero, zero. Um, there's a whole list in there. Uh, we have not implemented all of those yet, um, but it's definitely work in progress. Um, now, unlike Kubespray, we only support RHEL and CentOS because that is what our customers need. Um, we would be very willing to accept any PRs which add Kubernetes, uh, sorry, Ubuntu support or whatever else, but that will not be part of the testing efforts we do. Um, we, add, we worked a bit on ease of deployment um, to make it like, really easy to set up a cluster. All you have to do is create an inventory file, which can be like two files of five lines each. Uh, we added a make target, which will create a Python virtual env, which has everything you need pre-installed at the specific versions we have tested, which includes Ansible, all the Ansible dependencies, the Kubespray or our playbook specific dependencies you have to add as well. Um, then you just run the playbook, that's it. Um, some non-technical um, things we added as well is we spent quite some work, or are still spending quite some work with our technical publications team on um, documentation. So installation guide, operations guide, reference guide, the lot. Uh, all of that is available on uh, Read the Docs, and the link is in there as well. And we spend a lot of effort on testing. Um, Upgrade the installation testing, of course, upgrade testing, um, testing whether the services which we deploy are actually properly deployed and work. Uh, what happens when there's failures in the, in, in the network layer, in the storage layer, all of that gets tested. Um, I'm going quite quick. 
the future directions of this project. Um, not that long ago, we considered uh, the future of metal Kubernetes, and we decided to somewhat shift its focus, where today it's a general purpose deployment tool for a Kubernetes cluster, uh, with then some extras being deployed as well, um, where that cluster is a prerequisite of a product or an application you want to deploy. Um, excuse me. In the future, um, we are thinking of targeting it more as something you can embed in your solution as a vendor, where your solution is supposed to be installed on-prem at, on at a customer premise, um, and happens to be developed using Kubernetes or using container native um, architectures and can be deployed on Kubernetes. Um, now, the reasons why we decided to roll our own are still present. That has not changed. But the generosity we aimed for in the beginning um, puts too many constraints on what we can do. And now Kubernetes is, at least from my point of view, one of the first on-prem cluster solutions uh, which can scale up, but also can scale down to, say, one node, three nodes, uh, where the benefits were and the cost, because very often a, a cluster solution is quite complicated to set up and administer and operate. Um, and our customers, they want black box solutions. Um, so again, they're white box where a customer has actually access to the cluster and sees it as, I first deploy a cluster and then your application. Um, put some constraints um, again as well. Um, in the future, we think Metal will no longer, it's, it's not meant to be um, a multi-purpose shared cluster but rather something on which you as a vendor, you as a vendor, you deploy it as part of your bigger installer. Um, you deploy your application on it. Maybe you can run multiple instances of your, of your application on it. Maybe you can also run another solution you build on the same cluster, but it's not meant for someone else to run something else on that very same cluster. Um, so, Moving forward with all of this, and I know there's a lot of text in there, it's really just a laundry list of potential wishes, um, is we will keep working on everything related to documentation. This is important for, definitely for the community, but also for our technical services team. Um, we did consider to remove KubeSpray because it's a bit too big for our usage. Um, now, earlier today, I was in the session by the KubeSpray maintainers, and this may change again, um, because it turns out that their vision for that project is very much aligned with ours, so there's lots of room for collaboration there. Uh, one thing we may want to do is get rid of Docker and change it with, for Containerd or Creo, because upgrading Docker is not always easy. Um, there's... I, there's some interest in the cluster API um, for where we could provide an implementation of the cluster API for on-prem specific um, installations, but then there will definitely be a bootstrapping problem um, because for cluster API, you need a cluster in order to spawn a second cluster. And well, we don't have one. Um, and then there's a whole load of things we, we are looking into, like uh, NetBoot, um, integration of various other CNCF services like Jaeger or um, Isio, but all of those optionally. And depending on what your solution, what you want to build on top of this, or where you want to integrate this um, into requires, um, there's a lot of work we can do on the security front, be it uh, with the update framework, Notary, um, OPA as demoed this morning during the keynote. Um, then there's things like Kata containers, Firecracker, uh, Kubefer that are coming up. They can be useful to integrate as well. Um, but most of those should be optional. For as an example, um, we could opt to integrate something like KeepLiveD to do um, high availability and failover of various services. Now, if a customer already has um, an F5 or whatever uh, load balancer available, then there's no need to put it in here as well. Um, we do believe there's quite some room for a project like this in the community. So if this interests you, please reach out. We are currently working on the design, but then again, we will now hopefully be able to work with the KubeSpray maintainers to merge those efforts and then continue working on it. That was 
it. If there are any questions or remarks, please ask. Thank you. Right now we are not, because in the deployments we have, there are mostly like five servers um, where we don't need BGP. We just have a mesh. For the ingress, uh, we deploy it on all the nodes which are tagged as being a cube node. And there we use um, a host port to expose ATM443 on those specific service servers. And then it's up to or DNS or have your application talk to those IPs. Yes, uh, we actually use the ingress for um, NFS. Um, and that works by basically setting it up correctly in your Ansible inventory. Um, so all the services which we deploy as a Helm chart, you have the ability into, in your inventory, put some JAML snippets, and those then become Helm values. They are then used to deploy the chart. And as an example, the Nginx Ingress Controller allows you to, in the chart, set up, open up other ports, and then set them up towards the right services. Oh, sure. Sorry. There was. Stefano? Yeah, but it's not working. Okay, I'll repeat it. Okay, so um, the question was that indeed Swarm can work. Um, I was not involved when Zenko was deployed on Swarm, so this is, I just heard that there were issues. I believe we have a blog post outlining some of those. Hello, hello. Sorry, uh, I'm not quite sure uh, the, the question I'm going to ask is uh, repeat because I can, cannot hear your previous questions. So anyway, um, great work. So I just uh, Googled online. So it looks like there's another solution called the uh, Rancher uh, Kubernetes engine. Um, can you compare, you know, Metal K8S with this one a little bit? See the difference? Because actually I'm looking for a solution. So, just want to hear your opinion. I totally understand. Uh, if you're looking for a solution, maybe that's the one. Um, I should look it up. Uh, we have done the, the due diligence of various solutions, including Rancher, I remember, um, a year ago. I have a spreadsheet somewhere in my Google Drive, um, but I can't remember by heart. And even that information would most likely not be accurate today because Rancher has moved on as well. Sorry. Okay. okay. Thank you. How do you manage networking in uh, uh, bare metal Kubernetes? You have any plan to use uh, Flannel, or uh, currently you're using the uh, the default network that comes with CNI? So currently we use Calico. Okay, Calico. Okay, that's fine. Okay. And I've, as far as I'm aware, we will stick with that. Okay. Um, I, Sorry, sorry. I think you were first. Yeah, okay. I have two, uh, two questions. First one: Why you didn't consider Ceph as you still have? So I have two questions. First one, why you didn't consider Ceph as the storage for your uh, for the system that you deploy in Barometer? Is there a reason for that, or is it just? Uh... So um, there's two reasons. The first one being that 
again, for Zenko, there is no need. Okay. Because MongoDB, Kafka, whoever else, they do replication by themselves. So we okay. get the, the, the high availability out of those services. We don't need it at the storage layer. Okay. Secondly, we are a storage company. Okay, yeah, okay, yes, yeah, okay. So the second question is, uh, do you guys using your own hardware, yes, or...? Uh, uh, we don't use our own hardware. Um, we have partnerships with various hardware vendors. Okay. Um, but it's a customer who basically decides with collaboration of us and our input, okay. of course, based on our experience, okay. which hardware to buy. But, uh, well, so my question is, did you guys uh, have a chance to try deploying a special BCI like FBGA or NVIDIA GPU to be consumed by Kubernetes environmental environment? Sorry, I, I didn't get the okay, question. So for example, if you have some uh, board or service deployed in Kubernetes that need an NVIDIA GPU to do some kind of uh, machine learning or data, so do you, do you guys have a chance to try that to be deployed in... Uh, we have not tried that because we don't have a need for it. Oh, okay. I do know oh, Kubespray okay. has support for it. Yes. So if you can set it up on your inventory, then that playbook will pick it up and deploy things the way okay. it supports it. Yeah, okay. okay. Thank you. Um, I saw a bullet point in this slide somewhere about uh, integrating with corporate auth systems. Yes. Um, I think in Kubespray there's some OIC... Um, OIDC yes. uh, group VARs and stuff like that. Are there any other com like opinionated components or services that get deployed with metal cates to support that? Right now, no, but we have um, a project on GitHub um, tracking all of this. It's basically integrating OIDC um, where the investigating both DEX as well as oh, I forgot the name of the other project um, because some of our customers, they don't necessarily have an OIDC endpoint. They may have an LDAP server. So yes, we have to improve the, the story we have around authentication and authorization. Um, but so, so today, yes, you could set up the OIDC endpoints as far as Kubespace supports them. That will work. But it doesn't necessarily satisfy our needs. So, so there's nothing in uh, Metal Kubernetes uh, on top of what's already available in today, Kubespace no. for this? Okay. Thank but you. again, if you go to the GitHub, there is a project where we track the various issues which relate to exactly this, this topic. Okay, thanks. You mentioned that you were running, um, in public cloud, you were running uh, things like EKS, and standard public cloud services for Kubernetes. Are you finding any challenges managing Metal K8s um, and those public cloud Kubernetes offerings together as one offering to a customer in a hybrid scenario? Or I guess I'm, I'm trying to figure out why you would choose multiple cluster deployment mechanisms if you could choose one and roll your own and run it everywhere. Initially, when Zenko was started, um, the intent was to always run in the cloud. Turned out, customers also wanted on-prem. So we first built it for GKE, for EKS, etc. Only later came Metal. Um, why not always deploy on Metal even if you want it in the cloud and then use EC2 or whatever to deploy Metal on top of it? Um, honestly, that's a very good question. Um, I think part of it will be related to operations where operating Metal is more complicated than operating an EKS cluster, I would assume, at least. I never used EKS myself. Um, and there may be a pricing um, or total cost of the solution um, in, involved as well. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, over there. So you mentioned that those are mostly targeting long-term deployments. What's your plan for handling occasional upgrades with security patches? Um, then you are required to upgrade and run the playbook which will upgrade your cluster. To support the um, no downtime upgrades? Um, right now, I'll be very honest, if you would upgrade from version 1.0 to 1.2, which is in a branch is not released 1.2, but assume you take that branch, um, you will or you may have a bit of downtime for some services. Um, we are working on a solution to enhance that and not have any downtime. 
as observable from the end user of your application. Of course, pods will restart, etc. but there should be no downtime if you use the application running on top of Metal. Anyone else? Then that was it. Thank you.